a little talk about um, how we kind of get a better control over our infrastructure. I don't know if you've worked on projects where you you sort of know what's around the edges, but you don't want to look too carefully because you're sort of like unknown stuff in the middle. So my view on orchestration is that it tries to remove these unknown parts from your infrastructure. It really like helps you um, get a, a better grip of your infrastructure and how things are running reliably, smoothly, whatnot, all the good things. Um, so a bit of background. Um, I work on an open source messaging stack. That means that if you want to have your users talking, uh, communicating with each other inside a mobile app, it's a, mo it's a messaging stack you can add to that. Um, and it lets you add chat and whatnot. But to do this, there's a whole lot of components that need to be spun up. And we sort of took the, the Unix approach um, back in the day where we started building this, lots of individual services. Um, so instead of deploying a monolith, there's lots of little bits and the problem with this is whenever you've got moving parts or multiple bits that can be configured, they can be configured different ways and you start running into all sorts of nasty problems. So to think about this, um, we arranged something called Buddy Cloud in the Mountains. So took the team, we went off and we sat in a little hut in Austria with good internet for a week and we thought about how are we going to deploy code reliably and successfully. Um, we had a few really late night hacking sessions. Um, you know, this was about a year ago and everybody said Docker, Docker, you have to use Docker. So we started Dockerizing the world. Um, and we sat there and we, we got every single service into nice Docker containers. And then we were a little bit stuck. So like, what do we, you know, now we've got all these Docker containers. How do we actually run them? Now everybody will shout at you and say, okay, now you use like Apache Mesos or you go and you use Kubernetes and you know, everything works magically. But we were still a little bit stuck. So we kind of asked ourselves, well, what do we actually do here? <coughs> um, what's our job? Our job is to write code, to test code, deploy code and run code. There's a little bit of communication stuff and fluffy stuff around the outside. But at the end of the day, this is what we're, what we're doing. Um, well, we're going to try and like, focus on how do we deal with the last three bits. How do you get code smoothly into production? Um, and you know, back in the day, it used to look something like this, where you'd have like, a bunch of core services and a bunch of applications that would sit on top of it. Um, now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, well, you just docker that, and you docker that, and you docker that. Um, and that's one way to go. I'm here today to tell you that that's not a magical solution. There's no sort of silver bullet here. Um, I'm not going to deal with how do we change these services. I think that, like, you know, for any project, there's going to be core services, whether it's DNS or whatnot. Some people will use it. Um, like Amazon's DNS server, they'll use somebody other else's database server. We're really interested in just the applications that actually sit on top and how do we get those running smoothly. So I'm sure we've worked on projects that look something like this, where you, you're you hacking away on your keyboard and you, um, you've got to get something out there and you're your testing process is basically throw it at the users and see how many calls you get to the help desk later on. And we all know that this is not the right way to go. Um, so how should this look? Um, well, we're already using Jenkins for our build process. And we're already pushing stuff into GitHub. Um, we're already running unit tests. Um, we're shipping Debian packages out there. It's an open source project. There's lots of Debian files floating around. So, you know, we took the Debian packages and we put them in Docker containers. And you'll see that, that line ends there. There's no, like, put it in production. How do you put it in production? And this is where we were getting a little bit stuck. So, you know, we're at the point now. We've got all the bits as nice little Docker files 
lots and lots and lots of Docker files, and some of you will start screaming microservices. That's not the point here. The point is that we've got a lot of different services. Even the XMPP server was Dockerized, actually. Um, and they all fit into this infrastructure as Docker containers. But we still don't know how we're actually getting them from Docker files into production and updating them as stuff is coming into Git or being run through Jenkins. So yeah, we were, we were a little bit stuck at this point. And um, so we had a, you know, we sat down, we came up with this, this diagram here, where we were saying like, okay, we've got the laptop, we've got the server. Um, ideally, we want to just get the code onto the server. That would be the, the tar it up, SCP it across, untar it, restart the service approach. We know that's not the right approach. So we were sort of thinking, okay, we go to GitHub, we have a commit hook, it goes to Jenkins. Sort of seems like the right approach. But you'll see over here, there's still like a Docker image magically ending up on production and a Docker image magically ending up on your SI server. And, well, there's something unique about the production environment. There's something unique about the integration environment. And, you know, also on your laptop, there's something unique. There are sort of different environments. They've got different variables. And how do you make sure that when stuff is going to the two different, in all the different environments, how do you get these variables shipped around? So a variable might be like, which domain is this running on? Like, do I have a test domain? Do I have a production domain? Or which database user to use? Stuff like that. Um, now, I know you can pass environment variables into and out of Docker files. This is something you can do on the command line. Um, we were looking for a little bit more of an elegant solution and a solution that would let us say, you know, not only do we have a production server, not only do we have a system integration server, maybe we have like environments for every branch that we're working on. Maybe we, you know, any developer can spin up their own environment and it just works. Um, and we were getting a little bit stuck. So, I mean, we have our, we have our standard Docker file here. This is for the API server, so you can see it's it's nothing too special, except that we took out Elasticsearch because it was causing us lots of problems. But basically, we're exposing a port there, and you know, I think we're probably <coughs> yeah, it's pretty standard as far as things go. Um, and this turned out to be the first real problem that sort of started my sysadmin devopsy alarm bells ringing. Um, our environment looks like this. Um, we have standard web ports coming in. We use XMPP, so we have two other ports coming in and out. Then we have a bunch of different processes that need to interconnect. Um, now, Docker has two ways of working for networking. One, it says, I'm going to manage everything, trust me, and it, it handles your firewall rules and it pulls things in, in and out as, as different services stop or start. Turns out this is a little bit fragile. Um, the other way is you stick everything on a bridge, on, a, on an Ethernet bridge, and Docker will basically just plug it in. So you've, now you've just got a lo whole lot of services. You don't know which virtual Ethernet device is actually being plugged in, um, but it's, it's being plugged in and traffic is magically flowing between services. But I come from a security background, and this was starting to, to scare me a little bit, because now you know, I like to run a firewall on the boxes. And of course, you only want these ports coming in. Um, and the firewall stuff started to get a little bit hairy. And even then, Docker wasn't going to be orchestrating the firewall stuff. We're going to need a layer on top of that. Um, so then we had the great, great idea. We were going to mush all of this together. We're going to create the mega docker. So we basically concatenated everything together into the mega docker file. Pretty easy to do, you know, basically as long as you're taking out the from Ubuntu at the top and throwing in a few variables, you're good to go. And go. And go. So you've got a 108 line docker file there. This is great. I mean, if you only run it once, it's great. But the moment you start changing a, a line near the top of your file, 
you're going to get stuck. Because the way Docker works is you're, you're basically building layers on top of the file system. Every single command is a new file system layer. Um, so you change a line early on, and it's got to rebuild all of these other commands. So Docker is a nice container format. It's a shitty orchestration layer. Um, and this has made us think, OK, so we're actually missing something here. We're missing good orchestration. Um, so yeah, coming back to our how do we ship bits problem. Um, at the end of the day, we want the same code in development appearing on staging and in production. All you really want to do is be just changing a few environment variables. You just really want to say, OK, for staging, I'm using this database. For production, I'm using this database, and maybe these keys or whatnot. Shouldn't be more than that, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, should be easy to deploy. Um, before I started working on this, I was working on another project. It was sort of classic, horrible, gross, everything that can go wrong with enterprise software. You're paying like a thousand, uh, sorry, a hundred thousand euros per release, comes in every, every few weeks. It's buggy. It's basically a big zip file that you've got to download over FTP from a, a vendor. Um, inside the zip file is a, an install document, Microsoft Word, no less. Um, there's a few more zip files inside that. Of course, the, the deployment is, takes so long that you've actually got to schedule time in your calendar to do a deployment. Anyway, everything that could go wrong with, with enterprise software. So we know that we can do this better. We want it easy to deploy. Um, yeah. And then, you know, even with enterprise software that you pay a lot of money for, it often fails. So we want it easy to roll back. Um, and then finally, this is something I think is, is really important, and I don't think we give it enough credence. It's this idea that you have one truth. Um, this example here, where we, you know, we're getting this horrible enterprise software and we're deploying it. The conversation when a deployment would fail, which would be about every second time, would be like, did you add the patch and did you get the market data of this version from that machine and put it here? And you can imagine, it's just the wrong way to work. So what I mean by one truth is, I think we're quite good at this with, with software. We use Git for, for checking in, and you know, what's in Git or what's in the master branch is, is our truth. It's our gospel. Um, with DevOps, we're not always so good. And without DevOps, we're terrible. So um, this one truth really means that you need to know exactly what's on your, on your service. So it's not like that map of Africa where you sort of know what's around the, s the edges, but you're not really sure what's in the middle. Um, so when we ship bits, we really want to, to make sure that we're getting all of these. So we're not going to deal with SSH and Untile. We know that's the wrong way to do it. Um, with Docker, um, we, we jumped on this Docker bandwagon quite early on. And maybe that's why we got burnt. Maybe things are much, much better now. But um, I'm still a little bit skeptical. Um, and so for me, I think that you know, Docker is a technology. It's not necessarily a methodology. Docker is a building block that needs to be plugged into a bigger orchestration layer. Um, and in case you missed it, or in case you're not Netflix, this is a sort of standard like, but I should go microservices or, or uh, approach. And my analogy to that is that you know you want to ship a post or you want to send your friend a postcard in Los Angeles. You don't order an A380 and fly it over to Los Angeles with a postcard, you stick it in the post. And I feel like my, the microservice bandwagon is, is a little bit overkill for 99% of the projects. If you're Netflix and you're running thousands and thousands of servers, great, perfect for you. But um, proceed with caution, I guess. So I'll proceed with caution was really like, let's, let's build a virtual machine that is identical to our production environment and then identical to our staging environment. Um, it's not rocket science, but it did take a lot, of, a lot of work, and I'm quite proud with how it came out. So again, um, what's in our virtual machine on our laptops should be identical to the staging environment, should be identical to the production environment. And we came up with a simple rule that basically like commits update the staging environment, and if you do a git tag, it'll update production. Um, again, it's not rocket science, but it's just nice to know like 
what we had sort of an internal team agreement on how we were going to make this work, and that seemed like a nice way to do it. Some people prefer to have different branches um, for, for different environments, but this seemed to work with the way we were releasing software. Um, yeah, and if you haven't used Vagrant for building virtual machines, I highly recommend it. Vagrant is really, really nice. It does this really well, does it very reliably, and it also means that your Windows user can abstract away the Windows-ness from the Mac user, from the, from the Unix user. Um, and so right now, we, if you want to work on Buddy Cloud software, you just check out this Vagrant file, um, Vagrant up it, and it will get you going. You can see it, it exposes like a few ports, um, and then it does this magical little bit here. So Vagrant file just gets your virtual machine. It's sort of like you've, um, you've booted off a, a CD and you've installed Ubuntu. Great. But now you actually want to configure it exactly the way you want. So we wrote a little plug in here that just orchestrates or calls our orchestration layer, which looks something like this. Um, it's basically saying, put the latest version of Salt Stack on. Some, some of you probably use Puppet. Some people probably use Ansible. I like salt stack because it's sort of simple and it works and I'm not terribly religious about it, but it does the job um, and it lets us sort of define understandable rules about how our universe should work on all different environments. And then um, this is the magic in this file. It's basically um, two separate files which look a little bit like this. So you've got the master and you've got minions. Master will probably be, or you probably have one master in your environment that's then controlling minions for development or staging or production. Um, and the really nice thing about SaltStack is actually that you can, these minions could, could be living on Amazon, they could be living on Google. You don't care. It's all just abstracted away. Um, but to do this, we, we wanted to say, okay, we need this as close to production as possible. So we're just going to run it on loopback, and that's quite nice. Um, we've got our rules, and then we've got our, um, the fact that our minion and our master are just running on the same little machine, on the same virtual machine on our laptop. And that worked quite nicely. Um, but now we've actually got, so we've got our virtual machine. We've got it set up with a fair amount of disk space, two gigs of RAM, and now we actually need to start installing the software the same way that we would have it in our other environments. And that's what this is. So this is, this is SaltStack, if you're familiar with Puppet, it's, um, or if you're familiar with Ansible, it's, it's rather similar to, to Ansible. Um, and it's, you know, it's not dissimilar from a Docker file either. It's definitely faster than a Docker file because it's, there's a little bit more intelligence about you know, installing packages um, and not building up these file system layers. So it means that you can, you can run it across an environment relatively quickly. Um, and you also don't need to run it inside a container. You could use it to even orchestrate your containers, but you don't need it to run it inside a container. But yeah, it's just running through, it's setting up the database, stuff like that. Um, don't quite like that, but we can fix that later. Um, yeah. Um, and you saw early on the diagram with, with masters and minions. In any environment, you're probably going to have secure credentials. Um, these would be things like database passwords, SSH keys. Um, and something specific to, to salt stack, they use this idea of pillars. So you have your salt rules and you have your pillars. Pillars are basically just um, you know, confidential information that you don't want living on every machine. You want it shipped out just specific to that machine. So maybe each machine has its own SSH key. That would be pillar data that gets shipped out. Um, and it looks something like that. This is just a simple little lookup. Um, and so for each Buddy Cloud environment, we have something that looks like this. This is for the development virtual machine. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really as simple as then changing the environment, changing which branch we pull off, and changing the domain that we use. So yeah, this got us really quite far, actually. Um, something I'm quite proud of is this. We went backwards and forwards. We, 
so um, yeah, if one of the ways that I've always liked to, to separate environments is by domains. So you could have like a dev.example.com um, uh, uh, stage.example.com and a prod.example.com. Um, we went, we had some real problems with this because there's a little bug in Vagrant where it doesn't like running, forwarding two ports. So, so port 53 for DNS mm -hmm. runs on TCP and UDP. It just started getting really complicated trying to work around some of these little bugs. So we just set up a, a domain that basically points everything to localhost. Um, Actually, that's, I'll show you that next. But here you can see, um, basically, we've, we're pulling in the domain. Um, and so we created a zone file that lives in the wild, that whenever you query it, everything's just on localhost. And this makes quite a nice way to test on a local machine. And I can highly recommend it. Um, so yeah, um, just to summarize, like what we learned from this whole process is that you know, um, Docker needs to be orchestrated. Docker by itself is not your orchestration layer. We went down the salt stack route. You could go down many other routes there. Um, orchestration has definitely helped us. Um, we, you saw earlier there was that salt stack file um, orchestrating the different body cloud components. You can use, also use SaltStack to orchestrate Docker, and that works out really nicely. You can basically say, here is a Docker file. I'm going to, um, you need to be running these Docker processes. Um, and then the one truth, this, this also really helps. and avoids the sort of arguments of he, shed, he said, she said, about w what should be running where. So yeah, um, we'll jump into a quick little demo. Um, the code's all up on GitHub. Um, please fork it and use it. Um, and it's all Apache too. So let's uh, build a Docker file, or build a Vagrant file. Um, OK, can everybody see OK? I'll assume that is. So um, yeah, we've got our Vagrant file here. Um, this is the one that I showed earlier. Um, the important part is that we're, we're running this inside VirtualBox. Um, you could equally run it inside Google's or push it up to Google's compute, or if you're on a Linux box, run it in using libvirt, or you know, there's VMware um, helpers for it. Um, but then the simple part is, um, let's just destroy it first. So this will probably take a little while to run. So it's a good idea if we, I'll kick this off now. Um, and then while it's building in the background, we can run through any questions and talk about DevOps and how everybody likes to do DevOps. So leave that running. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> oh. Yeah, oh, you're, you're totally right. Um, so let me, um, let me carry on there. Um, what, we, what we've been doing, you saw the, the master and the multiple minions. So we added a hook so that every time software tests successfully on Jenkins, or well actually we've now migrated to using Travis, um, but when that, when that test runs through, then we fire a hook back on the SaltStack API that then does, um, it's called a, a high state, and it, it runs that. It basically grabs all the latest code and pushes it onto the environment. Um, so it's just running through the orchestration scripts, essentially. Um, does that? OK, and uh, one thing we are curious about in the process of things we're thinking is we use also chat orchestration. And um, um, 
the idea of Docker is you can reuse what you once built. So, I mean, you do testing to use your salt to to do the boost um, um, or the yeah orchestration, and and you have actually then a, a machine which should be equal to to production. So, mm -hmm. you could in a way, all for one could actually have this done in Docker, have an image. And the deployment production would be much more faster because you don't have to run the orchestration through again. Um, yes. Um, so the, that's actually getting the binaries into production. How do you plan on then telling that binary which um, configuration variables to use um, for production? Yeah, the only thing one actually should do is really to have the orchestration run only to set those environment variables mm -hmm. for, for injecting secrets or changes yeah. compared yeah. to, to test them. Yeah. So I think that's that's exactly exactly what I'm trying to say here is that you have your you can have your Docker files, but you need something to okay. make sure that your production is is perfect and that your environment variables are then written into production so your Docker file can pick them up and run with them. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so this might take a little bit of, of time, actually. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I sort of started looking at it. Um, so, yeah, I think we got burnt by Docker quite early on. Um, and then my other feeling is that um, there are other systems outside of just containers. You know, you've got your bare metal machines that you need to make sure that users have access to or whatnot. Um, and so you really need a system that can deal with bare metal and the containers. But yeah. How does everybody else do deployments right now? Okay. And how do you manage then your machines that you're deploying to? on Docker Compose image uh, repositories with the configuration. So the, the Compose orchestration configuration is in separate Git repositories. Okay. And um, yeah, those are uh, cloned to the server and the containers are started. Excellent. It's okay if anybody's using SCP untar. We won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, does anybody use CoreOS? Or has anybody looked at CoreOS? Because CoreOS's whole approach is that, you know, you just you actually don't care about the spare metal machine that you're pushing Docker files to. You're just pushing containers up to it, and it's it almost takes the, like the approach that that Android takes, where you've just got new versions of the OS coming in, and you don't care. They just get updated. There's like two. There's a production version and a next version and one's just pulling down the next version of CoreOS, and then at some point it just magically reboots. And you know that you're sort of like if you buy a Nexus device, you know that you're always running the latest version of the software. Um, you're never actually managing the bare metal machine. Yeah, so I'm afraid the network's a little bit slower than I expected. So if anybody wants to talk about this afterwards, um, come and grab me. Otherwise, uh, you've been a very uh, patient audience. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.